On today's episode of The Independent, Pete and I are joined by Paul Burmeister, the radio voice of the Irish. Paul talks about his crazy travel schedule the past three weeks and what it'll be like to call Central Michigan this week and Ohio State next week. Plus, Pete and I preview this Saturday's Central Michigan game. Welcome to the latest episode of The Independent. I'm Pete Sampson, joined as always by my co-host Matt Fortuna. Um, Matt, we've got uh, a game that everyone wants to get over with so we can get on to the next game. It's kind of one of those weekends around Notre Dame football, so we'll talk minimally about Central Michigan and uh, get into Ohio State, give people a sense of what um, is coming a week from now as our, our podcast will hopefully be expanding and be, we'll have an in-person event in Chicago as well. Um We'll talk a little bit more about that over the weekend. But um, before we get started, remind all our listeners, please rate, review on Apple, Spotify, depending on where you get your podcast. You can also catch this on YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube feed if you consume the independent that way. Um, it helps our podcast grow, get the word out. So we appreciate all of uh, our listeners so far. Uh, We've had a lot of growth that's been exciting to see. So, Matt, Notre Dame Central Michigan, what do you want to see this weekend? Um, And is there anything Notre Dame could show that would change your opinion about what may be coming down the pipe against Ohio State? You know, it's interesting, Pete. This is one of those weeks where your your radar's got to be up as a college football fan. And I say that not necessarily as a Notre Dame fan, but there are zero ranked versus ranked matchups. Like, this is about as dull of a slate from top to bottom as you can get when you look at the schedule. And when you compare that to week four, September 23rd, where you wake up with Clemson, Florida state, you go to bed with Notre Dame, Ohio state, you've got Oregon, Colorado, and a bunch of other good games in between. It's really, really different, but we've been around the sport enough where we've seen some stuff, my friend. And uh, (laughs) that means chaos will ensue this weekend in some quarters of the country. I don't think that will be the case in South Bend. Um, Central Michigan does not appear to be a very good football team so far. Uh, I think Notre Dame will win this one comfortably. Uh, but, but you know, you want them to come out of it, obviously, injury-free, certainly clean. Um, but, you know, I think we, we, we if they were to turn the ball over three times and win by 14, which wouldn't exactly be a great performance by their standards, I can guarantee you Marcus Freeman in the postgame and both me and you in the postgame show will come out and say, like, all right, now they have, like, actual coaching points and, like – can really drill stuff home and not be overconfident going into Ohio State. I think, you know, the narratives kind of pre-write themselves when you've got a, a weaker opponent ahead of a game as big as the Ohio State game. But but certainly, again, it's been three games for Notre Dame, two games for Ohio State. Um, Ryan Day just announced Kyle McCord as his starter for the rest of the season at Ohio State. I did not know that was, like, a question because the guy had already started this season. Um, so when I saw that going around on Twitter at first, my radar was up a little bit wondering if someone got hurt or if I was missing something, but no, I think it speaks a little bit to the quarterback you know, uncertainty, if you will, in Columbus, which is not a sentence. I think any of us have said in, in quite some time regarding that program. And it's the complete opposite of the situation Notre Dame has on its hands right now with Sam Hartman, which of course gives them, uh, you know, is the biggest reason they have confidence, uh, going into that game next week. But first, as you said, they've got to get through Central Michigan. Central Michigan struggled putting away an FCS team at home last week. Again, not a particularly strong program, even by max standards. Um, what are you looking forward to this Saturday? You know, probably a replay of Tennessee State. Um, I do think that the offensive line has probably the most room for growth of any position on Notre Dame's roster right now. They they were better against NC State than they were against Tennessee State when you adjust for the quality of the opponent. But I I go back to the beginning of the game, and you know Marcus Freeman talked about this on Monday. He's just like, I hate to admit it, but NC State came out more aggressive than we were. Um, and I think that you set the tone with your lines. Like that's your lines are where you can show aggression. And you know, first series of the game, Blake Fisher and Rocco Spindler give up a pressure to the right. Um, later in that quarter, I think Zeke Corral got beat up the middle. Like that's, it's not that the offensive line is getting overwhelmed by scheme. Um, they've just lost some individual matchups that I didn't expect them to lose. So that, look, like we've, you were here, I think, probably for those Ball State Vanderbilt games in 2018, where like Notre Dame had a good offensive line. 
but they played really poorly. And you're sitting there thinking like, how in the world is aligned with like Eichenberg, Mustafer, Bars, like Kramer, Hain- I think. Hainsey, yeah. Kramer, like, Hainsey, Hainsey. How is how are the how is this group just le- letting free rushers come through? And it's not like that um, with this with the current line, but I just think there's a lot of growth for it. And then for Notre Dame, for me to feel like, all right, I picking Notre Dame to beat Ohio State isn't just like, yeah, why not? Um, to have confidence that that's going to happen. I do need to see Notre Dame's offensive line play a little bit better than they played so far. Yeah, I'm not as down on them as you are, although you had some some, some pointed stats and, and, and examples in your story on The Athletic this week that I think illustrated they're not playing up to their potential um, quite yet. And that's been not cause for concern, but certainly a room for improvement. I, I want to see the defense impose its will. And by that, I mean, look, they've passed every test with flying color so far. I think Al Golden has been exceptional at making in-game adjustments. Um, they forced just five turnovers through three games. And I say just like, that's not a bad thing. It's averaging yeah. almost two per game. But when you look at the level of competition, you look at the manner in which some of those turnovers came, which were gimmies. I mean, I think it was Clarence, the pick to Clarence Lewis, the pick six was, was dropped right into his lap. Uh, I, I want to see a little bit more, aggression a little bit more of an edge from this group that, that that gives them the swagger and confidence to go into that Ohio State game thinking we're going to knock these guys on their ass and we're not going to take anything from anyone. Uh, so I think that's one area you can you can look forward to. Just just looking at the stats through three games, and again, I know it's it's tilted a little toward Notre Dame's favor because they've played that extra game, but if you want to look at the averages, Sam Hartman's second nationally in passer rating right now, 222.5 behind only Caleb Williams, the Heisman winner. I still don't know how pass rating is designed in NFL or college, but it's a stat that gets thrown around a lot, and it's an average. So uh, let's go with that right now. Hartman's also tied for second in touchdown passes nationally with 10. Again, trailing just Caleb Williams, the reigning Heisman winner, who has 12. Here's one for you. Audric Estime is averaging 8.02 yards per carry. Um, now you could – yeah, I mean, you make your, your face, that, I think, says it all. That surprises like, me because it's like – Last week, I thought that NC State actually did a, with the exception of one carry, did a really nice job. But that one carry counts too. But that's 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 most big backs. Like <laughs> yeah. you can knock them down nine times on the tenth time, they're going to get theirs. And and whether it's an eighty yard touchdown or a twenty yard touchdown, it's going to uh, you know tilt the stats, tilt the scales in their favor from a stat standpoint. So it, it's funny watching SMA play and hearing him talk afterward you forget this as a guy in just his third year of college. Like he, there, there's a presence about him on and off the field. Like even with the way Notre Dame, I think promotes him, whether it's with the Jerry Maguire video or, or you name it, like he feels like a guy who's been around the block a lot more than he has. And, and yet you look at it, he barely played two years ago. Last year, he was one of a number of different guys who, who carried the rock for them back there. And now, and again, you wrote about it. Like they've got five running backs they can turn to. Certainly he's, you know, number one by a, a comfortable margin there. But the way he's talked about in game, even by the broadcast crew, the way I think he's kind of consumed and, and, and gravitated toward by the fan base, it just feels like a guy who's much closer to his sixth year, like Sam Hartman, than he is, you know, in his third year. Yeah, I mean, feels like he's closer to his last year than his third year. Um, you know, and, and that's, maybe, maybe they're one in the same. <laughs> yeah, that's true with running backs everywhere. So I don't think that's saying anything all that explosive. But yeah, it's you know can. Can the tight ends continue to get more involved? Um, it's funny, like I have it on good authority that uh, after the first game, uh, Notre Dame's tight end recruiting targets got messages from at least one school about like, hey, they're not throwing to the tight ends when Michael Mayer's not there. Well, last couple of weeks, that would seem to kind of shove that back in the face of that uh, narrative. So you, I think Holden stays, um, you know, his continued emergence is – is significant um, and we'll get into this with Paul in our interview, but we talked a little bit about like the lack of a true number one receiver. Well, if you have a bunch of number twos and one of your number twos is a 245 pound, six foot five tight end who can catch 40 yard passes, like, you know, and most of that was catch and run. How many tight ends do you see in the country who have a 40 yard catch and run tight end like Holden stays did last week? That's, that's rare. Um, So you know, Jerry and Price, Jeremiah Love, I think continue to get better. Um, you know, it's it's Audrey Gasway's backfield, but Love and Price are the next two guys. Um, 
you know, do they take another step forward? And like, I, I'm with you on, on the defense. Like, is this, um, can you get back to how you looked against Tennessee state and Navy where it was just after the first drive, it was a butt kicking performance from start to finish. Like NC state provided a few more problems. Um, but I think Al Golden did a great job of making Brennan Armstrong look so average. Um, you know, he should be able to do the same with Central Michigan. Ultimately, that's that's why the Ohio State game is so intriguing to me. They don't have C.J. Stroud anymore. Um, Kyle McCord might turn out to be very good, but right now he's just another first-year starting quarterback. You know, it's funny when you you look back at last year's Ohio State game, and we've we've said this before, and Paul and us talked about it you know during our interview there was certainly a sense of like hang on for dear life right and maybe get a lucky break your way and, and escape with a win but you know you look at ohio state season last year and the way it played out obviously you know mo- mostly good they made the playoff but that was a program that could never run the football and got completely out toughed out toughened by michigan like physically mm-hmm. um you know they 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 Michigan took it to them, um, and, and Ohio State wilted in the fourth quarter. I think historically, Notre Dame is a program built very much like Michigan is now in the way they play and with how physical they are in the trenches on both sides. And, and I say that because you look at Ohio State through two games, and again, the competition is what it is, but 62nd nationally in yards per carry at just 4.59, 88th overall in rushing yards per game at 133 yards. Like, I, I don't want to, like – exaggerate and be like oh my god look at this but when you when you go into a game thinking like we've got the better quarterback and this team hasn't proven it can run yet and we pride ourselves on being a great run stuffing team that i think gives you an edge and a level of confidence that you simply did not have going into big games like this in years past particularly against teams that i don't want to say are finesse teams but teams like ohio state that can score their way and throw their way out of problems usually yeah, I mean, Notre Dame has earned the right to believe it can beat Ohio State now. Um, and I, I don't think there's we're going to see anything on Saturday that's going to move us off that one way or the other, including whatever happens between Western Kentucky and Ohio State, which would be pretty interesting because yeah, Western sure. Kentucky can score. Um, and I think Ohio State's defense is really good. Like they've got some, they've got dudes all over the place. But, um, you know, offensively, they don't seem like the – like the over talented bunch of creatures running around the field. Like they did last year. Like some of that is offensive line. So much of that is quarterback. Cause they still have Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka, but right. um, it just doesn't seem like the overwhelming amount of talent that it was a year ago. And that's shoot that. Look, they think about the they Ohio's... knocked the, they knocked their best receiver out of basically right. the season on the first drive and Ohio state still had Harrison jr. And the Buka and other guys Stover. Yeah. Yeah, they rolled. They 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 found a way to like cobble together a functional offense <laughs> without Jackson Smith and Jigba. But uh, yeah, that's that's going to be a hell of a week. Um, we'll have we're planning to have multiple podcasts that week leading up to Ohio State, um, and hopefully we'll do something fun post game after that show too. It's kind of still figuring out the details of that, but uh, yeah, plenty of good stuff to get to. Let's get to Paul Burmeister our interview, and then Matt and I will come back and put a bow on previewing Central Michigan. Pete, Notre Dame is 3-0 and off to a great start to the 2023 season. And you know the best way to get into the spirit of things if you're an Irish fan? Only my favorite collegiate apparel company, Homefield Apparel. They have great stuff from the archives of Notre Dame. All Notre Dame fans know how deep that goes at this place. I love the Our Lady of Victory hoodie. Wore it for a couple weeks. My wife stole it about eight months ago. Haven't seen it since. I love the Clash Royal Reich t-shirt. If you're wearing that in the Notre Dame concourse on game day, guaranteed high five from me. I have a wonderful Notre Dame Women's Basketball National Championship t-shirt from them. And I had to make a double for my wife as well as we both got Notre Dame Tennis uh, Faded Green Crew Necks. They are very comfortable. They stand out. They are the perfect gift if you are a Notre Dame fan. And the great news if you're a Notre Dame fan who is a listener to the show is that first-time customers can get 10% off their first order using code INDEPENDENT23 at checkout. That's on all Notre Dame apparel. Don't miss out on the most sought-after Irish apparel Available at homefieldapparel.com today. Matt, what have you always said is my biggest weakness on fall Saturdays? Well, Pete, I'd say your hair, but who am I to talk? Let's go with your wardrobe. Hmm, harsh but fair. As a friend and your co-host, let me tell you about the exclusive clothier of Notre Dame football, ESQ. 
ESQ outfits over 400 professional athletes, celebrities, and Irish players on game day with bespoke clothing that elevates their game off the field. ESQ sculpts every garment with precision, helping you look your best for work, weddings, celebrations, or in your case, Pete, the press box. Listeners of The Independent can get 15% off their first online order by using the code IND15 at checkout. That's IND15, or visit them at their Chicago showroom for a full custom look. Head to esqclothing.com to create your perfect fit. Pleased to be joined uh, by a return guest of Matt and I's podcast, even if it was by a different name, uh, Paul Burmeister, the voice of Notre Dame Radio and the voice of other things as well this season, as he's called all three Notre Dame games from three. No venue slash uh, medium has been the same, Paul. It's been uh, you've, you've had a lot of variety so far this season. And we will keep that streak going because now I'll be on the other side of the stadium in my usual spot in the radio booth. So uh, fourth game and and fourth different location. Keep everybody guessing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we uh, we were talking a little bit off air, and I know I, I mentioned on the last show that I ran into you Friday night as we were both kind of uh, stuck at LaGuardia for, for different reasons. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about the drama that led up to you getting to NC State because I, I did not realize a postscript um, – when I saw you the other night until we just spoke now. So I was on a, like an early afternoon flight, like I often do, you know, when, when Notre Dame is on the road and I got an email that said, your flight has been canceled. And like you guys, I, I look out the window, it's sunny. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And apparently there was a lot of weather coming in for the rest of the day. And then they canceled the flight that they rebooked me on. And then, then I started to get really, really nervous. And Matt, I saw you at the airport. I mean, it was, well past both of our normal bedtimes, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure. And after we said hello and kind of explained what we were doing, I went one way, you went the other. And then a couple hours later, after midnight, m- my flight was canceled then. So I was back at LaGuardia a few hours later, lucky enough to get on the first flight out. And then we landed. And, and as we're landing, guys, I'm looking around and it was so dark and rainy and lightning i'm like i i don't know if this is the right thing to to do to be landing this plane (laughs) but then once we landed the pilot got on and said okay the good news is we're here early the bad news is there's so much weather around us they won't let anybody operate the jet bridge so i sat there for almost a couple of hours and and really wondered am am i not gonna make this game because i'm sitting on the tarmac but they let us off we sprinted to the uh to the stadium and I got there 15 minutes early. So everything worked out. <laughs> That's 15 minutes before kickoff or 15 minutes before your usual time. 15 minutes before kickoff. That's what okay. I meant by early. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would have been a fun uh, broadcast. Ryan Harris doing play by play and analysis altogether. R- Ryan is a very uh, gifted communicator and has the gift to gab. If anybody could have done the entire thing by himself, uh, it's Ryan. <laughs> it's funny. I was uh, Greg McElroy did the TV and uh, on the way up, I think he was taking the elevator up to the press box. He was on his phone. I was like sort of lingering around and he was calling somebody to be like, yeah, um, I don't think I'm going to make my 5.30 PM flight after this game. Could we, could we push it to eight? Um, which I think probably killed him since his alma mater was playing Texas that night. But uh, yeah, we were all at the whims of, of travel, but uh, I, I was interested, like, you know, in media, like you want to get into a rhythm uh, and you've been doing this a long time, but like, how have you been able to get into a rhythm or not based on okay, week one, you're calling it from a office park in Denver. Uh, <laughs> week two, you're calling it, but you're on TV, not radio. And then week three, you're just sort of, you're back to your normal vibes, but just without the, uh, any kind of runway at all before the game. What's that sort of been like to sort of get into a flow of the season? I think I've been I've been trained as I sit here and listen to your question, you know, whether I know it or not, to just kind of I mean, each day presents such a different challenge uh, at NBC for me. I mean, I was nothing but football, mostly in the studio at NFL Network for a decade. And now, I mean, it's normal for me to, to be calling football on the road on the weekend um, to call or to, to host Premier League on a Monday or a Friday. I just I'm kind of used to, to different venues. I mean, different roles, play by player, host that when these things come along and, you know, now that we're doing the Olympics, most of us from not on site, I'm calling, a, I'm calling water polo at four 30 in the morning in a, in a studio in Stanford. So I'm kind of used to things not being quote normal. I mean, whether I want to be or not, it's kind of where we are, 
So as you ask that question, I'm nodding my head. I'm like, that's, that's a good observation. But based off of, of what I've done the last few years or what I've been allowed to do the last few years, it, it doesn't really feel that out of the ordinary. We're all looking past Central Michigan ahead to Ohio State. You're probably the, the one person who's like, bring it on. A, a game in the booth that I've been calling games in for six years that I haven't done yet, this will be easy compared to, to my early season schedule. But, Paul, what, what, what do you sense that might be different about this Notre Dame team through three games? I know two of the opponents were very subpar, but it, there definitely seems to be a different vibe around this team than years past. Yeah, I hate to start with the low-hanging fruit. I'm always going to see things that, through the quarterback lens. But, I mean, let's face it, this feels different, this kind of optimism. And there are a lot of teams and a lot of fan bases that feel way more optimism than they should at the early point of the season. However, I think it's justified with Notre Dame because of Sam Hartman. And there are a number of other really encouraging things going on with the staff and the team that I want to talk about. Uh, but something has to be at the top of the list of why the optimism is justified with this team. And for me, in all caps, it's Sam Hartman. Yeah, it's a, I mean, you see like the confidence that Marcus has at the end of halves, I think is such a an indicator of yeah. how the staff views the quarterback position, because like you cannot trot out a two minute offense if you don't feel like you have a quarterback who can run it. And I mean, you you played the position. Um, what is it about Hartman that's a little bit different? I mean, what where does he push the needle in a way that you know some previous Notre Dame quarterbacks maybe have not? I want to start with kind of what what you hinted at first, Pete, and that's the relationship that he appears to have with the head coach Marcus Freeman, and I assume he does with the other coaches as well. And every now and then, my pedestrian career way back when, you know, kind of connects a dot to something that's happening right now with the quarterback. And I remember when I was a senior. On Thursday nights of game week, I would drive to the Iowa football complex and I, I parked in Coach Fry's spot because Coach was gone for the night and the offensive coordinator said it was OK. And I would walk in and the offensive coordinator, uh, offensive coordinator and I would sit down and just watch film and go over the game plan like we were colleagues. And like two years prior to that, I was just this kid on the team and I wasn't afraid of the coaches, but they were way above me and I was way down here. And when I was a senior, and I was only 21 and Sam's 24, but once I got to that chair and I was the guy, it was almost like the offensive coordinator, the head coach were colleagues and we were all in it together. And mm -hmm. they didn't treat me differently in front of the team, but there was certainly that trust and that vibe that I was kind of closer uh, to that level than I was two years ago. And I think Sam, because of his experience and because of his talent, I mean, what I remember there, I mean, he has that times 10. So I don't have a behind the scenes look at how it really plays out. But like you, Pete, I, I kind of feel there's a special relationship between this veteran experienced quarterback and his coaching staff where they're kind of operating. I don't want to say as equals, but kind of like colleagues. And to mm -hmm. me, that's where it starts. Paul, how do you think that elevates the entire operation? I know it sounds like a simple question, but I guess in the sense of, uh, you know, they don't have Ohio State's wide receivers. They, they they have a defense that looks really good so far, but I don't think anyone's mistaken it for Georgia just yet. How does having that one guy at that one position just elevate everyone around him and reset the ceiling for this team? I think, first of all, everybody, especially in college football, they – Team, teammates want to gravitate toward that guy and they can buy into an 18 year old freshman who's super talented and we see it all around the country. It, it happens quite a bit. But when that person is approaching 50 starts with all kind of success and he's 24 years old and by all indications has a very like a, a kind of personality and a vibe around him that, you know, people are drawn to. So I think I think you begin with that and that elevates everybody because they want to believe in that guy anyway. And when he gives you real reasons to believe in kind of a special kind of personality way, that, that, that makes it even stronger. And then as far as what you mentioned there, Matt, about hey, the, the receivers aren't fooling anybody for, for the Ohio State group or for the Alabama group. I think during the spring and summer when we're thinking about this a lot and we don't have Saturday games to, to point to, we all worry about that. It's a concern. But now that we're three games in, and I know the other teams haven't been that strong yet, and they certainly will be soon – the quarterback is so good that if the other groups around him are okay or pretty good or maybe even really good, that's all right. The defense appears to be terrific. The running game is leading the way. I think the offensive line is going to be pretty darn good. 
if each one of the receivers or if, if, if there is a receiver you can point to as a star, that guy could go be a stud at Alabama or he could start at Texas right now. Maybe one could, maybe one couldn't. My point is if every single one of those guys is either OK or, hey, you know, what, he might be really good. That's fine because everything around him mainly the quarterback, could be really, really damn good. I, I'm not as concerned about Notre Dame not having a star pass catcher as I was in July. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that because I, I, I'm just uh, if you sort of agree with me on this, like it, I think Notre Dame has like about five number two receivers and no number that's ones. Fair. Yeah. But if your quarterback can identify which of your number twos is matched up against their number three corner or their number four safety – like you can, that can be a strength. But if if you have a quarterback who can't do that, if can't make that reads, that's where the lack of a number one really kills you. Is that is that kind of what you're getting at? I mean, do you sort of see it in the same through the same lens? Exactly. And I I think you and I talked this summer at one point, Pete, about the receivers a little bit, and I, each one of us had some concern about you know what is that group going to provide based off the fact that not one of them was really really standing out yet, but. I think you bring up really good points, Pete. And to add on that, where, where my mind goes, listening to you talk about the, the this receiving group, this pass catcher group to go along with Sam, one step further, the play calling can really help with that too. So yes, the group is pretty good. Yeah, the running game could be great. And Sam's going to recognize where the ball should go a lot of the time, more times than not. You can also call plays in a way that you're not expecting one of these guys to perform like an All-American. I mean, it's only three games in, but Notre Dame doesn't have this college passing offense where Sam's staring at the sideline the whole time. He claps for the ball and whips it out wide for an extended running play. He's not taking two steps back and taking shot plays 10 or 12 times a game. They're doing everything in between. Sam loves to throw the ball between the hashes. I think he's really daring that way. He likes to fit it in at the 15 to 20-yard level with a seam yeah. or an in route. He likes to take a shot at the corner. Again, 15 to 20 yards downfield on that seven route, that post corner route. So you need a good receiver. And thankfully, they have a number of good receivers to make that thing sing. But you don't need a guy who's on the Bolitnikoff Award watch to make that happen because you're not flipping him the ball at the line of scrimmage and expecting him to make six people miss and pick up 40 yards. And you're not expecting him to turn that 50-50 ball into a 70-30 ball. I, I, and again, I know it's only three games in against teams that haven't been that good yet, but I think the play calling is really not only uh, conducive with the skill set of the wide receivers, I think it takes advantage of what Hartman really wants to do, and that's hang in the pocket account longer than a lot of guys would and try and fit it in somewhere in the middle of the field, 15, 20 yards downfield. Paul, in that same vein, I'm sure you've gotten some time with Jared Parker, whether it was in the offseason or, or in season, but you know, as a quarterback yourself, what sense do you get for how that trust has developed between quarterback and play caller? And, you know, this wasn't the guy Sam Hartman committed to Notre Dame to play for. And yet right. through three games, they're they're passing with flying color color so far. I think big picture wise, and I've I've had two different chances to sit down with Jared once in the summer. Uh, and then uh, during training camp, and then once leading up to the Tennessee State game, uh, I think it was the day before kickoff. And first of all, I got a feeling from him, the similar uh, vibe I used to get from Clark Lee when I sat down with him, and that this person sits down in front of you, and, and okay, you, you're talking X's and O's, and you, you kind of want to get some insight to the personnel, but if you take a step back from that, you realize, man, this person just cares. This person is... Uh, likes the seat he is in. He likes the team. And it's just a, I mean, we'll see if he's a good offensive coordinator. I mean, everything points to to yes, but this is just like if, 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 if your kid was being recruited by Notre Dame and this person came and sat in your living room, you're like, he's a good man. This is a guy who appreciates where he is. And he, he, he gives off that kind of feeling. I think, first of all, that I, he reminds me of Clark that way, really thoughtful, really kind, really appreciative of where he is. Uh, in terms of him calling plays, what I really like, guys, is that – and I was a big Tommy fan. I, I, I liked Tommy Reese a lot. I liked how addicted he was to the X's and O's and the schemes and all that. But Jared Parker, he grew up on the perimeter of college football, coaching wide receivers and kind of seeing the game out there. And now he has Joe Rudolph, another former offensive coordinator, who's the offensive line coach. He played offensive line in the Big Ten. He's been an offensive coordinator. He's coached the O-line for decades – he can help Jared kind of with, with that part. 
And then you've got a, a former quarterback, a former offensive coordinator in Gino Gadouli on the sidelines talking to Sam Hartman. So you bring up Jared Parker. I think of the feeling I get from him just as a dude, as someone who's really likable calling plays. But then I think he's into collaboration, and I think he's got mm -hmm. a great group to do it with, with a former offensive lineman and a former quarterback helping him draw up the plays where it's not just him and the way he sees it from the wide receivers out to the defensive backs. He's leaning on a lot of knowledge he has on the interior part with Joe and whatever Gino can add to. And I, 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 it's, it's early, but I really like the way those three seem to be putting it together. Yeah, it does seem like the egos are different in the room, and that's not like a dig at Tommy at sure. all. Like, but because I, I think his self confidence was actually a real asset for him. But I think Jared, yeah. and this sort of gets back to your Clark point. I think one of Clark's strengths was like he knew what he didn't know. He knew yeah. his weaknesses and was able to sort of like fill in with staff around him. And I think Parker's similar to that. Um, you've you obviously spent some time with Marcus. Um, and I was interested, particularly the Tennessee State week, because you, you get a different kind of access than we get. But like watching him in press conferences and interacting with him, I do sense like a different level of confidence that he has and sort of like his message, how he delivers it, um, you know, how succinctly he can get a point across now. Like, do you sort of sense a different Marcus in year two in terms of how he's managing this operation than, than maybe what you picked up in year one when everything was new? Yeah, I, I think year one, he was uh, extremely likable and authentic, uh, but but brand new. I mean, everybody saw the potential. Everybody saw the mm -hmm. likability and oh, you're like, OK, let's let's see where it goes. This guy hasn't done this before and let's enjoy the ride. And now that he's in year two, uh, he's still authentic. He's still likable. But there's just this confidence that uh, like we all have when we when we go from year one to year two, whether it's as a parent or, or as a spouse. I mean, pick anything that dominates your life. It's a big deal to you that can kind of change your emotions any moment of the day. You go into that second year and you feel better. And I, I think Marcus definitely gives that feeling. And from that kind of generality to the specifics, and I haven't asked him this question, but my feeling is from watching him and saying, okay, this is a little bit different dude in a better way in year two. I think he loves his staff and I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I don't say that in a comparative way. Like, Oh, I worried about how much he liked the staff last year. I, I think the dust is settled. It's not brand new anymore. And as he looks around, I just get the feeling these these are, are people he enjoys being around and people that he really, really believes in. And one of the stories he shared with me, like last year, I mean, he was just the defensive coordinator. And I think it's hard for anybody in the abstract to let go of something that was yours. So I think he was on the defensive side quite a bit in the meetings mm -hmm. with Al Golden. Al was brand new. He brings in a pretty complex NFL kind of system. I think Marcus was there quite a bit, and now he believes in in Al so much, and he, he I think he walks away from that side. He's like, this is all good here. You guys don't need me here. I'm going to go over to the offense and spend some time with these guys. So, uh, I, I think he feels very free to move about the team the way he the way he wants. He doesn't feel like he has to spend time with the defense that was his, and it all goes back to my main point of why I think, in addition to just the basics of going from year one to year two, I think he really likes and believes in his coaching staff. Paul, switching gears a little bit, looking ahead to Central Michigan, um, probably not unlike two of Notre Dame's previous three opponents with Navy and Tennessee State as far as just it's a game they should win and should win comfortably. What are the challenges of preparing to call a game like that, especially with an opponent outside of Navy that you're probably not all that familiar with and that the general public isn't all that familiar with? And talking for 60 football minutes about it when <laughs> – yeah, you know, in most cases at halftime, the outcome is is already decided. Yeah, it would be uh, it would be totally different, Matt, if I was calling this game on TV. Because when you're doing it on TV, and I just had this challenge with Tennessee State, you're doing the broadcast side on the other side of the stadium, and it's likely going to be a blowout. You're going in thinking, okay, in the second half, when when Notre Dame is up by 28 or 35, what are we going to talk about? And then you move over to radio, and what I've learned is that there's so much description involved that having that full bucket, as we say on the TV side, like better have your bucket ready, it better be full in the second half because you're going to need it. Um, in, in radio, instead of getting into the 10 stories about Sam Hartman that I think might be interesting if Notre Dame is up by quite a bit, 
you know, maybe they've moved from the left hash to the right hash, and maybe he's not looking at the sideline anymore. He's in the huddle, and maybe he's looking down at his wrist to call a play. I'm going to say that after Ryan's done talking about the play. You know, Notre Dame now back in the middle of the field. They're actually huddling up now. Uh, Hartman was just looking at the sideline, and now he's looking down to his wrist. He's still looking down, reading it. Okay, he clapped his hands, and he walks up to the line and sees Central Michigan has four down linemen, three linebackers, and, and, and that, then the ball is snapped. So there's so much description required in radio uh, that it, it, that's kind of an assist in the, in the games, and we'll see how this game goes. But when you get a blowout, you don't have to dig so deep into what might be interesting like you do on TV because your job in radio is never-ending no matter what the score is in terms of describing what you're seeing on the field. All right, enough Central Michigan talk. Ohio State, <laughs> you, you called the game last year. I think Notre Dame went into that, like sort of holding on for dear life from opening kickoff on the way their, their game plan was constructed and did a nice job of it. Um, yeah. This feels totally different to me and Matt. Um, what What is your sort of level of anticipation? What do you think we're going to see a week from now when Ohio State comes here? Just like the vibe and the tone of the game. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good way of looking at last year, Pete, the way you described it. Hold on for dear life. It was competitive. It was close to the end. Felt a lot like the Georgia game. Was it three or four years ago now where it was mm -hmm. like, hey, this is a game. Notre Dame athletically is, is doing pretty well and it's close in the fourth quarter. But is the offense really going to score two more times? So th there was that feeling in each of those last couple of games. So I, I think this is as evenly matched as, as anyone could have imagined it would be as they thought about the matchup in June and July. Coming back to Sam Hartman, number one, and I know we've hit everything on Sam, and I think he's going to erase that feeling that even though the games were close in Columbus last year and in Athens three or four years ago, there was a real concern. Is Notre Dame going to score? I, I know they're keeping it close, but will they put points on the board? I don't think that's going to be the case. So if we can go to the other side of the ball, I'm going to be looking at those three linebackers. And they've been blitzing a lot more than what I'm used to, which is really fun to watch. And it's not only what they're doing behind the line of scrimmage, guys. They're, they are from sideline to sideline. Those guys are everywhere. And you expect their instincts to be good in between the tackles and to go where their reads tell them. But they are chasing things down, not just running backs at average or below average teams, but they're chasing a lot of skilled players down. And are they going to be able to do that against Ohio State? Is Notre Dame going to be able to dial up aggressive blitzes with linebackers and sometimes safeties against an offensive line and backs and tight ends that are more used to picking that up. And it, let's say that they protect for a count longer. Can these corners that look to be pretty good, okay, how good are you? The linebackers didn't get home. The quarterback slid to his left. He's got an open open look-see now. Are these guys still covered? And that's – as I almost, I almost assume that Notre Dame's going to score some points. Defensively, and they've been terrific so far, can they continue to – to be as impressive against a much better team. And specifically what I'm looking at is the pass rush. And when it doesn't get home, and there'll be plenty of times it doesn't because Ohio State's that good. Can the corners hang with those wide receivers? If you want to get your colleague as, riled up, ask him about safety blitzes. Um, Ryan Harris <laughs> just loves he, he that has this thing. He loves it. He, uh, he, he gets fired up about that. He gets mad at the referees. I love it. He gets mad at the referees every single time they throw a flag. It's awesome. <laughs> so good. Well, side favorite part for me for, for calling these games. As a broadcaster, I know as a, as a fan, as a, as a viewer, obviously, you know, points are stylish. Like having an offense that could put up 40 points per game, that, that's very easy on the eyes. As a broadcaster, is that is as exciting, is it more exciting for you covering and calling a game that way uh, as, as, as I would imagine it is, as it is for a fan as opposed to a 13-10 game? hundred percent. And I, it just professionally, if it's an ugly 13 to nine slog, I mean, it's my job to have the same kind of enthusiasm and, and description um, as, as I would if it was 27, 26 and the quarterbacks are going off, but absolutely. I mean, at the end of all this, I'm just like you guys, I'm a fan. Like I, I'm up there to work. I'm in South Bend to work or wherever the fighting Irish are playing, but I have, since I've been four years old, I freaking love football. And I like being around it. I like watching it. I love watching quarterbacks uh, throw the ball downfield. And when, when that's going on, I don't feel like working. And it's kind of a cliche to say that. I've heard a lot of people say that. But I truly, when I'm at a game where the offenses are clicking and it's a sold-out crowd, 
I feel like I ought to be the one paying to be there because I, I'd, I'd buy the ticket to watch it anyway. So a long way answering your question, Matt. But yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible amount of fun when the offenses are going back and forth. And there are a lot of points. Uh, there's a joke here about Iowa and the drive for 325, but I'm not going to make it uh, in your presence. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 you would can. be like yeah you need to pay me to call this game. Uh, <laughs> be a different. I'm vibe. actually in uh, in Notre Dame's uh, first bye week. I'm calling the Iowa Minnesota game on oh, NBC. Yeah, well, so, we don't. I will win that one because they always win it. It'll probably be 13 to 10 again with yeah. where they get outgained by 300 yards. But <laughs> yeah. actually, on well, the subject of Iowa, I, I am going to Champagne this week. Give me your best uh, you Brett Bielema, your old roommate. Yeah, Give me your best Brett Bielema story. I, I've got one of, oh, of you, I think, from him, but I don't know if I what's can share the, it on the show. What's this podcast rated? Is it is it PG thirteen? <laughs> exactly. What are we? We're, it's the end of the day. We can do whatever we want. E, e stands for everyone or explicit um, in our <laughs> podcast rating. <laughs> uh, Brett, um, I mean to, to keep it uh, to keep it clean and fun. I remember uh, it, back in college when all of us were wondering what we were going to do. Uh, Brett knew I'm going to be a head coach in major college football, I'm going to be damn good at it. And he would tell anybody that would ask him. Um, so he, he's always known what he wanted to do, and it's fun. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch the ride. And I, I remember I had a – I think I was covering the Premier Lacrosse League in Boston when he was coaching with the Patriots maybe three, four years ago. And we, we don't get to see each other that much anymore, but we ended up going out to dinner and just catching up, talking family. And it was really, really cool for me to see after – how much success he had early in his career, just piled up the wins and went to Arkansas and things didn't work out the way he wanted. Uh, and then he went back to being an assistant coach for Bill Belichick. It was really cool to see how that affected him. And like, we all have an ego. We, we all have a lot of confidence. And every now and then professionally, we get thrown a curveball and we got to kind of pick ourselves back up again. And uh, as much as I've loved his success, it was really cool to see how, how he was forced to um, kind of have a different outlook and a different kind of perspective when he wasn't a head coach anymore. And he talked about how much he would, you know, love to be one again someday. And now here he is. I know they're not off to a great start, but I think if you look at the, at the total program, it seems like he's doing pretty well there in Illinois. So just, uh, just proud of him. I well, thought you, you were uh, going to mention, uh, what, what, was it this Pearl Jam that you guys all went to see in St. Louis? <laughs> Did we? Players? <laughs> the show he was told that me good. A, he told me a story uh, I, it involved a lot of you. I think it was Pearl mm -hmm. Jam, but he was like, I'm just picturing if one of my players tried doing that today, where like they drive mm. through the night and back eight hours and come back for practice. I, I, I do remember driving to a World Series game after we beat Illinois on a Saturday. It was like game six, uh, Braves, Twins in 91. And Matt Rogers, who was a quarterback ahead of me, his dad was Jimmy Rogers, who was the head coach of the Timberwolves at that time. And I, I think he... I think he got his tickets to uh, to sit in the upper deck. So after meetings and whatever we did Sunday, we we got somebody's van, drove to Minneapolis, watched the game, drove back in the middle of the night, and like went right back to practice. So I'm like, I wonder, if, I wonder if somebody brought a story like that to Brett and it somehow stepped out of line or things didn't work out. Like, how understanding would he be um, as he went back through his Rolodex of the things we used to do way back when? I would hope so. Well, you you create a segue on the cross because I think for people who don't know you well, like you're about to be a Notre Dame parent as well. Um, tell people about that. Cause that's kind of a, a, a cool story about kind of what's coming in the future for uh, team Burmeister. Yeah. So my, uh, my oldest son, who's now a senior in high school uh, decided early on that lacrosse was his favorite sport and uh, he had a pretty good talent for it and worked really, really hard at it. And once a fall, since I got this job, I think when he was in seventh grade, he would come with me to Notre Dame and just like he, like most kids, I mean, he loved it. What's not to love? I mean, the stadium's full, the campus mm -hmm. is pretty. And I think he he started to think at an early age, man, if I get really good at lacrosse, you know, maybe a school like Notre Dame would want me. And he got better and better uh, and got bigger and bigger. And I uh, had a wonderful summer last year when all the recruiting showcases were going on. It turned out that Notre Dame wanted him and uh, they were here to visit. The coaches were here to visit early last fall. And he had some other really, really cool opportunities and some, some schools that were also would have been wonderful. But he picked Notre Dame in the end, and I, I tried to stay out of it, guys, because I didn't want to push him too much because obviously I'd love to see him all the time, which I'm going to get to do. But I tried to stay in the background and just support from a distance. And when he picked Notre Dame, I'm like, how, how cool is this? I've, I've got a job I love on that campus, and it's going to take me right to see him six or seven times a year. 
Um, so I appreciate you teeing me up on that, Pete. It's one of my favorite topics in life that, uh, <laughs> that he, he's going to be there and I'll be there next to him for, for quite a few years. That's awesome. I think we'll get you out of there on that note because you can't top that. Paul Burmeister, uh, radio voice of Notre Dame football. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and look forward to seeing you. Uh, I'll, I'll see you in two weeks at Ohio State and hopefully not an airport before then. And Pete will see you uh, at Central <laughs> Michigan this weekend. Man, yeah, if you're in an airport before Ohio State, something has gone seriously wrong. <laughs> right? Exactly. Guys, I, I appreciate the chance to hang out with you. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Paul. Second down 10, ball right hash. Three pass catchers to the left of Hartman. Three-man rush. Stands on the 15, holding the ball, looking. Now rolling out to his right. Still looking. Throws near sideline. Wide open, Chris Tyree. Near sideline, 45-40. Inside of Wolfpack territory, 20. Down to the 15, cuts it back. Brought down to the 12-yard line. Wow! Great awareness by Hartman to flip the ball to Chris Tyree, who ran 60 yards. It's now first and 10 Irish on the Wolfpack 13-yard line, 48 seconds until halftime. Estimate the tailback to the right of Hartman is in the shotgun. They give to him up the middle to the five, hesitates, scores. Bumped into his own lineman on the three-yard line, regathered, and then ran across the stripe by himself. Seven-yard touchdown for number seven. Notre Dame now leads North Carolina State 37-17 to with 10.42 left in the game. That was Paul Burmeister. We thank him for joining The Independent. Uh, you guys are all familiar, obviously, with his work as the radio voice of the Irish. Pete, what was your biggest takeaway from our conversation with Paul? Um, that he has to pay Notre Dame tuition. Um, <laughs> I was going to say that lacrosse, lacrosse is still going to be really good because they've got a Burmeister on the way. <laughs> yeah. No, it's... Um... I forgot that he is called water polo at four 30 in the morning from a studio. So maybe calling the Ireland game from, uh, and the a TV station in Denver wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, I think Paul does a great job. I think he's, um, he's got a, a good voice, a good presence about him. Um, so yeah, it's, and it, it's fun to sort of have his voice be a little bit more present in the show. Um, again, shout out. Thank you to Notre Dame radio network for, give you some clips throughout the year to add a little production value. So you get, you get to hear a little more Paul Burmeister on the independent than uh, just our, our one on our interview from this episode. Well, and he, he also has the the privilege or um, punishment of calling his alma mater <laughs> yes. during a game this week too against Minnesota. Cause we know that game will be low scoring. We know Iowa will somehow find a way to win it. Um, but no, pa- Paul's awesome. Um, I think Notre Dame fans are very lucky to have a radio voice as established and as credible as, as he is. Um, obviously him and Ryan Harris are, are friends of the show. And um, look, Paul, Paul's got a job to do this week uh, calling central Michigan, but I think he's like most of us excited to see what this Irish team really is about a week later against Ohio state. And, and you know, certainly I'm, you know, as a writer you know, and a podcaster, like those are the games I get really excited about writing about um, as an announcer. I can only imagine. I mean, you know, we had Mike Tirico on ahead of the Clemson game a few years ago and, he was, you know, downright giddy about the idea of calling it, and sure enough, it exceeded expectations by going to double overtime and, and Notre Dame winning. Um, let's get to this game. <laughs> first things first, Central Michigan. The line, as I see it right now, is thirty-four and a half. The over/under is fifty-three and a half. Uh, most of the public money is actually on Central Michigan. Most of the sharp money is on Notre Dame. Not probably not too surprising. Pete, uh, how do you see this one playing out? I. I think if there was a game ever a time for Notre Dame to not cover for the first time all season, it's it's Saturday. Um, they don't need to overextend themselves to prove anything to anybody. Um, I think they sort of have the most of the kinks worked out and ones that are not worked out probably are not going to benefit by running up the score on the Chippewas. So I like central Michigan to cover. That's a huge number. Um, so I'll go Notre Dame 45, Central Michigan 13, like which is pretty narrow uh, cover by Central Michigan. But it just – it feels like Notre Dame is not going to cover every game they play. Um, you know, and this is a, a look-ahead moment. Not that Central Michigan is good enough to make it dangerous because it's a look-ahead moment. But if I was Notre Dame – and I could get Sam Hartman out of there maybe a series earlier than I would have otherwise, or get Joe Walt out of there a series earlier than I would have otherwise, then I, that's, that's probably how it would roll on Saturday. And just like, 
give Steve Angeli the Tennessee State treatment where he can run the offense for a quarter and a half before kneeling it out um, because Notre Dame is, is, gets out to a very fast start and then maybe the second half feels a little bit more even. Yeah, and let's not forget either, like, it's not just Ohio State in two weeks. It's Duke the week after, Louisville the week after, right. USC after. Like, the the level of play is probably not even triple-A, double-A to the major leagues as, as far as the first four games versus the next four games. So, um, they're, they're, you know, it would be in Notre Dame's best interest to put this one away early, get their starters some rest, and see what they've got behind them. Um you know, it, we, we all saw Monday night football. I'm a Giants fan, thankfully not a Jets fan. I love the Giants didn't exactly um, cover themselves in glory uh, this weekend either, but like, yeah, like, you know, we're all, you're always one play away from the entire narrative of your entire season, just being completely flipped on its head. Um, so certainly you want to not take anything for granted and not take central Michigan for granted. I've got nerding covering barely, but the under I've got 42, seven. I just, mm. I don't see central Michigan really doing much of anything offensively. Yeah, and I, I think, think this is a game where I think it'll be like 28, seven at halftime or 35, seven at halftime. That's what I was just going to say. Cause I, I'm, I think I'm just banking on like a, a central Michigan touchdown with less than five minutes to go in the game against Notre Dame's second and third teams. Like I, I feel like the flow of this game, it's going to be 28, three at halftime and Notre Dame will win the second half 17, 13, you know, something like that. Um, you know, where it is never in doubt, but the second half feels like more of like, is this we've got a running clock? Like the new, the new clock rules are not moving this game along as quickly as I would like. Um, but I think, I just think Notre Dame will kind of pack it in on the earlier side um, after getting off to a hot, hot start. Like the, the Sam Hartman, what he got off to 11 touchdowns in his first 12 drives, like, this will this will be more like that, um, but maybe it will be four out of five in the first half, and then that will be a wrap. Yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we can learn a whole lot from the offensive line in a game like this, unless they play terribly. Um, yeah, I mean, we could you know, we could learn something in a negative way, right? Like uh, you dominate Central Michigan, okay? You're not like that's the difference between you and a Max mm-hmm. school. You're you're bigger up front, um, but I do wonder if Notre Dame just you know runs the ball at will relentlessly and gets out of here, you know, as quickly and as skate three skate free as possible. Um, I, I just, there's, <laughs> this is the challenge of, of, of being a head coach and no one's, you know, shedding a tear for, for Marcus Freeman right now, but you know, these guys are all human. Um, they've all subconsciously or not had that game next week circled on their schedule. No, Marcus minute, Freeman was, mentioned Ohio state in the Monday press conference. He brought it up on his own, right? Yeah. Before, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, the, the one thing I'm sure we'll have a lot of this talk next week on multiple shows is the irony of if Notre Dame does beat Ohio State and Marcus Freeman, Ohio State graduate, beats Ohio State, what that all means. Um, I, I may have said this on a show before or not. I don't remember. I, I think I've said it to you off air, Pete, like Bill Landis, our old friend who used to work with all of us at the Athletic um, at Big Time Media Day this year, he said to me, you know, that Wisconsin game should be scary if you're. Ohio State fan because of Ohio State or excuse me if Wisconsin wins it every Ohio State fan after losing to Michigan twice is going to say Luke Fickle should should be our head coach and he's at another Big Ten school and I said Billy you know they're, they're playing another alum <laughs> before that right uh Notre Dame and he, he said I don't have it in me to to like tease my readership with that possibility of losing to two alums uh, who are at different Midwest programs in the same year uh, under these circumstances, but yes, I mean, there is some pressure under Ryan day and, and Ohio state in general that they probably have not had before because of the way the last two seasons ended in the regular season, but we will get to that next week. Uh, that's all I've got on central Michigan, unless you have some more analysis. You <laughs> no, wanna, I have no, uh, no hot takes on Jim McElwain, um, and, him bringing the Chippewas here for what I think it was supposed to be like the Brian Kelly classic. And then Brian Kelly's not going to be here for it. The so. Butch Jones classic, the, uh, who else coach her? John Bonamago. They, they, you know what? Here, here's my challenge to the Notre Dame stadium, uh, scoreboard operator. Can you play baby shark when central Michigan Ooh. runs out of the tunnel? I like that. You've suddenly made the game a lot more interesting, Matt. <laughs> uh, I hope people over at Notre Dame are listening to this part of the podcast. 
uh, that would, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's a, an early band opportunity here. Like so, there could be something here just to, just to spice it up a little bit. See how, uh, see how McElwain, uh, reacts to that. Cause I don't, I don't think he maybe would react all that well. I don't think you'd react well. Also, like, I don't, don't, don't do that. Like, I, I, yeah. I think it's a funny idea. You don't need to stoop to that level for central Michigan. You've got the green jerseys for Ohio state. Like you've, you've done enough to, uh, to make one game unique that that deserves being unique you don't need to go and and do that to little brother so um i think we'll get out on that note uh that's pete i am matt a reminder you can subscribe to the independent on apple spotify google and wherever else you get your favorite podcasts and please subscribe to our youtube channel because what is the independent without seeing the beautiful bald faces of both myself and pete so Thanks, as always, for listening. Uh, We will catch you guys post-game after Central Michigan. And thanks, always, for tuning in to The Independent.